Friends, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to this lesson. I would like to shed more light on the deferment of the Constitutional Amendment Bill Number 10 of 2019 from yesterday, Wednesday, 24th June 2020, for another date during the course of this meeting. Let me begin by reminding you and through you, the general public. The Constitution Amendment Bill Number 10 of 2019 was presented to the House on Friday, 2nd August 2019. Since it was presented in the third session of the 12th National Assembly, the bill lapsed by reason of prorogation of the House. However, and in accordance with Standing Order 126, of the National Assembly standing orders of 2016, the House on Tuesday, 3rd December 2019, resolved to restore the bill to the order paper for consideration at the second reading stage. In this regard, the bill was placed on the order paper for Wednesday, 4th December 2019, as the order paper of the day. However, during the debate, Honorable Minister of Justice sought leave of the House to defer the consideration of the bill to a later date. Debate on the bill was accordingly deferred to another date. Subsequently, on Tuesday, 17th March 2020, the bill again was placed on the order paper or resumption of debate on the bill. Debate on the question was not concluded on that day and spilled over to Wednesday, 18th March 2020. However, on that day, 18th of March 2020, the House adjourned prematurely due to the coronavirus 2019 pandemic without debating the bill. Ladies and gentlemen, at the time of the premature adjournment, the Constitutional Amendment Bill Number 10 of 2019 was on the order paper and as the order of the day and was not considered. In this regard, the House began transacting substantial business on Tuesday, 23rd June 2020. The Constitution of Zambia Amendment Bill Number 10 of 2019 appeared on the order paper but could not be debated because Honorable Mr. Speaker had not concluded rendering a ruling at the time of adjournment. The bill, therefore, the bill was therefore placed on the order paper for Wednesday, 24th June 2020, for resumption of debate. During the debate, the Honorable Minister of Justice sought leave of the House to further adjourn debate to a later date within the same meeting. Allow me to state that Standing Orders Committee derives its powers from the National Assembly of Orders of 2016, which in turn derive their authority from the Constitution of Zambia, Cap 1 of the Laws of Zambia, Article 77 of the Constitution of Zambia, which provides as follows. Article 77 1. Subject to this article and Article 78, the National Assembly shall regulate its own procedure and make standing orders for the, conduct, for the conduct of its business. At two, the proceedings of the National Assembly shall not be invalid due to A, a vacancy in its membership, or B, the presence or participation of a person not entitled to be present at or to participate in the proceedings of the National Assembly. Three, they shall preside at the sitting of the National Assembly, the Speaker. B, in the absence of the Speaker, the first Deputy Speaker. C, in the absence of the first Deputy Speaker, the second Deputy Speaker. O, in the absence of the second and another member of Parliament, as members may elect for that sitting. Four, the quorum of a meeting of the National Assembly shall be one-third of members of 
Parliament. In this regard, the National Assembly promulgated the National Assembly of Zambia Standing Orders of 2016. The Standing Orders Committee is established pursuant to Standing Order 149 of the National Assembly of Zambia Standing Orders of 2016. And Standing Order 149 states as follows. One, there is hereby established the Standing Orders Committee comprising the Speaker, the Leader of Government Business in the House, the Leader of the Opposition, Party Whips, and four other members appointed by the Speaker. The Speaker shall be the chairperson of the committee. In addition to other duties placed upon it by an order of the Assembly, the Standing Orders Committee shall consider all proposals for the amendments to these Standing Orders. The Standing Orders Committee shall appoint members to serve on a committee of the House. The committee may circulate reports and recommendations of the committee to members of the Assembly and within the prescribed period. No objection in writing signed by a member has been received by the clerk. The reports or recommendations shall be deemed to have been approved by the Assembly. The prescribed period shall not be less than four sitting days if the house is in session and 21 days if the house stands adjourned provided that a on presentation on representation from the speaker that the matter is urgent the standing orders may prescribe a shorter period b if an objection is received from a member within the prescribed period the committee may consider the validity of such objection and may cause the report or recommendation to be brought up for consideration by the House or resolve that the report or recommendation be deemed approved by the Assembly, in which case the report or recommendation shall be deemed approved. The current composition of the Standing Orders Committee is as follows. One, the Speaker as chairperson. Two, her owner, the Vice President, as leader of government business in the House. Three, Honorable Dr. Ngandu, MP and Minister of Finance. Four, Honorable JJ Mwimbu, MP and leader of the opposition. Five, Honorable Bimundubile, MP as government chief whip. Six, Dr. S. Msokotwane, MP as UPND whip. Dr. JK Chanda, MP. And eight, Dr. H. Kunda, MP. And nine, Ms. M. Subulwa, MP, and 10, Mr. D. M. Kundoti, MP. The Standing Orders Committee is the highest decision-making body in the National Assembly and is charged with the responsibility to consider all proposals for amendment of the Standing Orders and other rules of procedure. You may wish, you may wish to know that there is no express provision in the National Assembly of Zambia Standing Orders 2016, which stipulates the time within which a bill must be considered at any stage of enactment. Nonetheless, the National Assembly manner of putting the question and procedural notes handbook, which forms part of the procedures and practices of the House states at page 11 as follows. Note, A, if a bill is deferred for six months, it is killed. In short, a bill that has been deferred for six months lapses in terms of parliamentary practice and procedure. In this case, the bill lapsed on Thursday, 4th June 2020, having been deferred on 4th December 2020. However, at the time it lapsed, the House was still on recess. And it had not been for, had it not been for the premature adjournment in the February-March meeting, the second reading stage could have been probably concluded one way or another. Ladies and gentlemen, 
in view of the foregoing the standing orders committee the standing orders committee met on wednesday 24th june 2020 to consider the request by honorable minister of justice to defer further consideration of the bill to a date not later than the last day of this meeting I want to just ask the indulgence of this meeting to repeat one paragraph where I said, in this case, the bill lapsed on 4th of June 2020, having been deferred on 4th December 2019 and not 2020. I read it as 2020. Apologies. However, at the time it elapsed, at, at the time it lapsed, the house was still on recess. And had it not been for the premature adjournment, in the february march meeting the second reading stage could have been probably concluded in one way or another ladies and gentlemen in view of the foregoing the standing orders committee met on wednesday 24th june 2020 to consider the request by the honorable minister of justice to defer further consideration of the bill to a date not later than the last day of this meeting it is for this reason that the Standing Orders Committee resolved to extend the life of the Constitution of Zambia Amendment Bill Number 10 of 2019 to a date not later than the last day of this meeting. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chief Whip. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is time for you members of the press to uh, seek clarity from the Honorable Chief Whip on um, this statement. We we'll use that, uh, those two microphones just to get clarification. The floor is open. It was yesterday, the 24th uh, of June. Yeah, now my question is, uh, um, so in three years, eh? Okay. So we'll take uh, three questions at a time. discuss the bill when it lapsed on the 4th of June. Uh, yes, like I pointed out earlier, I started by defining the roles of the Standing Orders Committee. This is the committee that makes rules of procedure that governs the operations of Parliament. So as to whether it was legal, yes, it was legal because before it was tabled on the floor of the House, the committee sat in the morning and resolved that um, Bill 10 could be tabled. I'll also uh, remind the media that uh, the Standing Orders Committee is the highest decision-making body of Parliament. You are aware now that um, the manner in which Parliament is sitting 
is not a usual manner. You have people sitting here in the amphitheater, in other committee rooms and other designated uh, areas. It is because this same committee, the Standing Orders Committee, amended the rules because the rules as they stand, as they stood, was that we could only conduct business in the chamber. Now, because this particular committee is given power from the constitution of Zambia under Article 77 to regulate its own procedure. So this standing orders committee amended the rules in terms of sitting that parliament is now able to sit from various locations using electro electronic gadgets. So it's the same committee that yesterday in the morning looked at the issue of uh, the Bill 10, uh, which ordinarily should have lapsed on the 4th of June 2020 and resolved that it should be discussed but be concluded before the end of this meeting. And the reasons are simple. We are all aware that at the time of adjournment on the 4th of March, Bill 10 was on the floor. And as a matter of fact, there was a member of parliament for Chipata Central who was actually debating when the, the, the proceedings were interrupted. So if you look at the 4th of June, there was nobody at parliament by 4th of June because of COVID-19. At that time, parliament was not sitting. So in short, had it not been for the COVID-19 pandemic, this particular debate on Bill 10 should have been concluded within the month of March. But discussion or debate on this particular bill was interrupted because the House adjourned prematurely. Now, this committee has power to change its own rules. This particular rule of the six months rule is not necessarily in the standing orders. There is no rule in the standing orders, which are the rules that govern. But in the procedural notes, these are procedural notes in the handbook. It states that if a bill uh, stands for six months after For which reason that the Standing Orders Committee convened yesterday, looked at the circumstances. Remember, in this particular case, it was not on account of the mover of the bill or any other reason, but force majeure, a act of God, where we all were sent away and we sat in our homes and nobody was in parliament. So therefore, parliament, through the committee, acted within its own powers to revive the life of this bill and place it on the order paper for further debate. Any further questions or points of clarification? Yeah, I've, I've understood your, your response, uh, but just a sort of uh, follow-up. Um, COVID-19 uh, really affected Zambia around March, and uh, I think uh, this uh, circumstance was foreseen. Why wasn't the decision by the Standing Orders Committee, uh, or, or, or why didn't the Standing Order Committee uh, decide uh, way back because uh, it was predicted after uh, a partial lockdown, so I can call it that way, that uh, parliament would uh, adjourn and open at a later stage, and now it has opened. So why 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 did you not decide way back that uh, since 4th June, uh, this bill will, will lapse? Uh, why, why after 4th June? And then secondly, as proponents of Bill 10, looking at the circumstances now, um, where do you place the viability of this bill to see the light of day? Thank you. Yes, as I read in my statement, a parliament substantially only opened on the 23rd. So maybe the question that is being asked is, why didn't we consider uh, extending the life of this bill around the 4th of June. 
you are aware that um, a parliament was not sitting. Parliament only resumed its sitting two days ago. So it was not possible, therefore, that uh, this could have been brought up to the Standing Orders Committee. It came to the Standing Orders Committee yesterday, just a day after Parliament um, resumed its sitting. As to the viability of the bill, uh, I want to assure you that um, I think this bill has been the most debated bill, a constitutional amendment bill uh, in this country. Uh, the debate around this bill has been going on for the past 42 months. And uh, there's been a number of arguments uh, that we all know about, uh, arguments of uh, process, arguments around content, arguments around trust, and so on and so forth. And I think that uh, at this particular stage, uh, people are in the clear, because there's been a number of versions, especially for those that are opposing uh, the enactment of Bill 10. Uh, they started from the process. And I think this particular aspect was addressed because the process of constitutional amendment is provided for in the constitution under Article 79. And under 62, it's only parliament that is given power to amend the constitution. What that means then is that uh, parliament sitting alone without going to uh, any conference or any other platform, MPs sitting at parliament alone can amend the constitution. Now, what seems to have happened in our case is that um, people have been carried away with other processes other than those that are provided for by law. I want to say that there is what we call um, a new constitutionalism. This is not law. These are just traditions and conventions where you talk about dialogue, where you talk about uh, 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 other meetings, so to speak. So what people have been carried away with are to say there was no consultation, there was the law provides that MPs sitting at parliament alone can amend the constitution. But if you look at this particular process, you realize that uh, the, 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 those that were promoting this process actually embraced, they embraced other views by extending a consultation even beyond what is provided for by law. And what do I mean by that? If you look at the process from 2016, for instance, from 2016, when there was a private member's motion in parliament, Minister of Justice went countrywide, giving an opportunity to everybody to contribute to the constitutional amendment process, the process of amending the Public Order Act, the process of amending the, uh, the uh, Electoral Process Act, and indeed contributing to uh, the political parties bill. So when Minister of Justice was going for consultations, they were looking at these four documents. So at that stage alone, in terms of a wide consultation, that was done. Secondly, political parties as key stakeholders met in Siavonga. They met in Siavonga for three days to discuss and bring about uh, the concerns regarding this constitutional amendment process. So they actually came up with a document which was called the Siavonga Accord, where it was agreed on what needed to be done. So the major content of the process at the National Dialogue Forum actually came from the Siavonga uh, meeting. So we want to say that uh, we are very confident that uh, this uh, uh, bill is going to go through because a number of people have actually spoken to, to, to this uh, process. Remember, when you're talking about consensus, you're not talking about unanimity, it's not possible to get 100% support. So it's, it's, it's about numbers, it's about the majority. If the majority say yes, we of course expect others to, to say no, it's normal, it's part of the democratic uh, process. So people should not be uh, 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 worried that other people are opposed to this process. It's part of the, the democratic process. So we are very, very confident that um, the bill is um, going to go through. And I also want to comment that um, uh, I know most of you must have covered the press briefing that was uh, 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 done by uh, the UPND and addressed by the Honorable Jack Mwimbu, who is the leader of the opposition. I know that when he was addressing um, the press briefing, he made reference to uh, the fact that the presentation of the bill will be illegal. Uh, maybe the question is, what does it mean it's illegal? It should be against a law or not allowed by law. But as I read in the statement, Honorable Mwimbu was part of the decision yesterday. Yesterday in the morning, he was part of the decision of the committee that resolved that the bill must be debated. So when he was addressing the meeting, 
he should have made reference to the, the, the resolution of the Standing Orders Committee because he was part of it. So we were surprised that uh, he deliberately ignored that part and did not inform the press that he actually was part of, part of uh, that meeting. He's also aware that uh, that committee that he belongs to is the highest decision-making body. So he should have therefore respected the decision of that, uh, of that committee. We were very surprised that a member of the committee decided to deliberately mislead the public by saying the, the decision to allow the bill to come on the floor of the House was illegal. So that was indeed very, very unfortunate. We don't expect that to come from a member of the committee. So there was nothing illegal about that process because the rules were amended. And they were amended legally because they were amended by a body or a committee that is amended, that, that is mandated rather, to, to come up with the rules that regulate uh, a parliamentary procedure. very much. Do we have any more questions or points of clarification? I see no, no indications. So do you have any concluding remarks? Yes. Um, in, uh, in, in conclusion, we, we want to, to, to encourage um, uh, all of you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to follow uh, uh, this process of enacting the constitution very, very closely. Uh, we know that um, even in the future, should we be faced with such a situation, you must be fully equipped with what, first of all, the law says uh, about uh, the, the process of amending the constitution. I want to tell you, for instance, that um, issues of mistrust arise in many constitution-making processes. Normally, uh, maybe the minority in the House or other stakeholders uh, sometimes feel that uh, they will be shortchanged by the majority. So there's what we call constitution agreements. In many cases, uh, stakeholders uh, get to what are called constitution, uh, constitution uh, uh, agreements. These are agreements that are made outside parliament to give comfort to, to those that may feel if they go in the house, they'll be defeated by numbers. So this is not part of the law, but these are conventions that have been promulgated under what we call new constitutionalism. So when you talk about constitutional agreements, for instance, in the case of Bill 10, I'll tell you that the Siavonga Accord can be described as, as a constitutional agreement because we sat in Siavonga as political parties and signed an accord on what we wanted to see in the constitution. So most of the, most of the clauses in the constitution were actually those that were agreed upon by political parties sitting as stakeholders in Siavonga. I would also tell you that um, when the Justice Minister uh, gazetted the amendment, it can also be described as a constitutional agreement because what he simply did, he preempted all those who may have been uh, uncomfortable and not thinking that maybe he will be unable to move, to move those amendments. So he went and committed himself because firstly, he came to cabinet as justice minister and cabinet pronounced itself on the recommendations that came from the committee and directed the minister of justice to go and move those amendments. Now to give further comfort, he actually amended, he, he gazetted the amendments so that those that were not sure that amendments could be uh, moved were now very, very comfortable. I also want to take this opportunity um, to remind the media that uh, our friends in the um, uh, UPND have been shifting goalposts from the beginning. They moved from the process. When we addressed the issue of the process, they moved to the content. And we were very clear in our address to say where was the content of Bill 10 generated from. It came from the Siavonga uh, meeting, for instance, where all political parties, including UPND, signed that particular court. The content of Bill 10 came from the technical report from Ministry of Justice which was a report that was assembled from the many submissions that people uh, countrywide made. Civil society organizations, churches, up to 111 organizations uh, made submissions to Ministry of Justice. The content to Bill 10 came from the NDF, where 450 delegates gathered for a period of 16 days and submitted to that particular process. When we addressed these issues, they shifted to trust. But before we move to trust, there was a committee report 
that came out of the, uh, the select committee. And when we engaged our colleagues, we asked them, we said, are you comfortable with the recommendations? Honorable Jack Mwimbu himself, my, 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 my colleague on the other side, said he was very comfortable with those recommendations. But he was quick to add that he did not trust that the PF were going to move those amendments. So when you talk about consensus, at that level, there was consensus because our friends in the opposition were comfortable with the recommendations from the committee. What was next was how were these recommendations going to find their way in the constitution? So once that was done, we expected there to be settlement in terms of argument. There were proposals to say withdraw the bill, incorporate these amendments, and bring back the bill. But of course, my colleagues here, the, 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 the technocrats, will tell you that bills are not processed like that. The moment you withdraw the bill and incorporate other items, it's no longer bill 10. Maybe it's bill 18 or bill 19. It has to run the full course of, first of all, being gazetted and then coming to committee before it's presented for second reading. So we told our colleagues that uh, you know that Bill 10 is just like any other bill. We can't process it by firstly withdrawing it and reintroducing it. Why don't we find a way of giving you comfort of introducing these amendments? Minister of Justice went out of his way. He did something unusual when he presented his policy statement when presenting the bill for second reading. He actually preempted by presenting the amendments in his policy statement so that there was commitment on the floor of the house. All the MPs know that what the minister says on the floor of the house is binding. He can't depart from it. But the sentiments around trust continued. The Minister of Justice went further to gazette the amendments so that that was a final point to say, this is what our commitment is. Now, what he did also was to ensure that people don't run back and forth he gazetted the amendments by embedding them in Bill 10 so that people could see the complexion of Bill 10 as will be presented in Parliament. Now, people ran away with an argument to say what he was doing was illegal. What he did was simply to gazette a government decision. And the gazette is just a journal, it's just a publication where sometimes government decisions are, are published. So there was nothing illegal about gazetting those amendments. Because Bill 10, as it is on the floor, is still in that original form. But the minister was simply saying, what Bill 10 will look like when I take to the floor, when I move the amendments, Bill 10 will look like this. That's all that he did. But because I think those that are opposed to Bill 10 uh, are bent on uh, fighting Bill 10 to the end, even when their concerns have been addressed. I think the questions that you may have is that when you look at the concessions that the Minister of Justice has given, the concessions that government has given over Bill 10, are so many. What concessions have been given on the other side? None, and none at all. So the issue of consensus is not about one grouping. I want to remind uh, uh, you, ladies and gentlemen, it's not about one group not agreeing then there's no consensus. For instance, in this particular case, we are very saddened that that same spirit is being extended to parliament, where a committee makes a decision, a committee makes a resolution, because one member does not agree with that resolution, he calls the resolution illegal. He can't. When we say it, uh, when we talk about consensus, not being unanimity, you must be able, in, you must be able to give and take. In constitutional making, it's about give and take. You win some and you lose some. That's the only way that you can proceed. So in this particular case, for instance, the, 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 the case at hand, where people are saying, no, 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 despite the resolution of the, of the committee, the fact that I did not agree, then it's illegal. You can't. It can't be about one, one grouping. So we are very confident that um, we are going to have an amended constitution in this meeting. This year, we'll have a, an amended constitution, a constitution that is going to include the marginalized, uh, by introducing a, a mixed member electoral system that will see the youths come to parliament, see the disabled come to parliament, see the women come to parliament without going through those direct elections by finding safe seats for the people that are, ma are marginalized. I, I don't know of any youth that is going to fight the amendment to Article 47. I do not know of any differently abled person 
that is going to fight amendments to Article 47. Neither do I know of any woman that is going to fight amendments to Article 47. I don't know of any chief that is going to fight amendments to Article 165. So when you talk about Bill 10, it's a collection of many other clauses. So you can't have a single group that despises or condemns all the clauses because the youths have an interest. The church have their own interest. The judiciary have their own interest. Every grouping has got an interest in there. As an MP, if you ask me, my interest is that um, under Bill 10, as an MP, I will now go back to the council because under the current constitution, I don't sit in the council. And yet I'm the one that goes around campaigning and promising people. When it comes to implementing the, the, the development, I'm removed from the council. So I'm very excited that uh, you know when, when the constitution is amended under Bill 10, I'll go back to the council. Just like I'm also excited that there'll be delimitation after the, the amendment to the constitution. So we know that um, others are claiming to be speaking for a, a lot of Zambian people, but I know that those that are going to benefit from the amendments of the constitution are much more than those that are opposed to it. I thank you very much.